again next week, Wednesday morning at 2.30 if you want to come out and join us. <laughs> and, and we always start at Long Beach. Long Beach is the first beach always on the list. And then we'll move up the coast from there and we'll be done in September. So this is my beach and this is the Claylock story. And, and we can talk a lot about Claylock and I won't. But Claylock is the small beach on the north end of, of, the, uh, of our razor clam zone inside the Olympic National Park. And it has a long history of very sporadic razor clam setting. And you can see when it does set, that's five clams per square meter, which is a pretty dense number of razor clams. And we've seen that two, on two different occasions, major spikes like that at Claylock. And then in uh, 2009, a, a similar spike. And then no setting of juvenile razor clams for a long period of time. This was last summer. It followed the heels of a very small population of adult clams in 2015. But the number of juvenile clams that was on the beach that 2015 surpassed anything I ever, I couldn't find anybody who's any, seen anything like it. So that aluminum ring that we showed you earlier, if there's five or six clams in there, that's going to be a pretty dense population. It averages out as you go down the beach. During the summer of 2015 in Claylock, we saw two inch clams that are, these are all recruit size clams, these are all clams I'm showing you here that are over three inches. So three recruits, little guys, two inch clams, and that aluminum ring, we saw between 250 and 400 razor clams all along the beach. It was mind boggling. I, I called a, a colleague who lives at Lake Cornell, who's been retired for a number of years. I sent him a picture, and I called him, and he said, You photoshopped me, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> and he used to be my boss, and he was acting like it, you know? <laughs> and you're, you're full of crap. That's just what I don't believe. <laughs> so I said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to come get you tomorrow morning. I'm going to bring you up here. See this, and he did, and his jaw was on the ground. It was phenomenal. When we came back in 2016, a lot of those clams weren't there. I'm not surprised. No beach could really handle that much population. Uh, when we came back and finally got this beach open in January of this year, um, we opened it for two days, and there were no clams left. You couldn't find. We had 600 clam diggers, and they came off the beach with 56 clams. There was no clams, and it wasn't a bad weather day. And we dug one more day, and we said, we're everybody out of the pool. There's something's happened here. So that's clay line. I'm not going to belabor that. Um, I'm going to show you these one by one. We're going to add each one here. This is the Mock Rocks Beach. This is north of Grace Harbor. Mock Rocks generally is a pretty solid population. Anything that's around two or three clams per square meter is a very solid population. We had a very good set here. That set is still uh, it, it, really, it really fed two good seasons. We still have a very average population there in 2016. We'll see where we're at when we go back up there this, this, uh, this summer. Um, we, we didn't see a lot of small clams last year, so I'm concerned that this might be even a little bit lower. We didn't see a good recruitment, a good sign of a recruitment. We'll find out when we're back. This is Copalis Beach. This is around Ocean Shores. You can see again a little bit more consistent, but a lot of up and down, natural variation here. An okay population there this year. This is the Twin Harbors Beach. Um, strong population. If you got out to Twin Harbors, and we finally did get, get it open this year, you probably saw that. Good clam digging. Nice sized clams. Uh, very successful uh, harvest when it was open at Twin Harbors. And we've seen some good setting there the last couple of years as well. And then Long Beach is a dark one. Long Beach is always the lowest because of the southern two-thirds of the beach that really is not a very dense population in most years. Most of the razor clams and, and, and most clam diggers, especially local people in the they're gone, drive to the north end for successful clam digging. And the populations are always much more like this on the north end, but we're, we're looking at the beach as a whole, and as a whole, I mean, it brings that average down. And this is just, I just picked out Long Beach. We always also generate uh, the average length data whenever we finish a stock assessment. And this was last summer at Long Beach. This is, these are the clams we're going to harvest or look toward harvest on and design our harvest for. And these are the clams that are smaller that we're looking toward for the future. That's actually a pretty good sign. That means these clams are going to be up in here this next year. These guys are going to be a little bit bigger, uh, I suspect. So that's, that's a, that looks like a pretty good population by all. It's got two pretty good year classes in there. I'm not going to show you the other beaches. Just didn't want to take too much time. This is the distribution of clams. 
the density wise down the beach at Long Beach, so from the south end to the north end, this is five clams per square meter. You can see in general the south end is a little lower. And it certainly is in pretty good shape here at Ocean Park and certainly in good shape up in Oysterville. And this was an exceptional population. Remember I told you that it's one of the strongest populations at Long Beach we've seen in over 25 years. And I have laid on to this the average over the last five years, just to give you a little bit of an idea and put it a little bit in perspective. Um, the gold bars are last year, the blue bars are the long-term average, a little bit long-term average. And you can see the, this, this, the south end really is pretty weak most years. Um, it's a little better in the center part of the beach and definitely stronger up at Oysterville. And if we were to add in 15, 20 years of data, that wouldn't change that much. That's typically how this beach looks. And that's likely mostly an influence of the fresh water coming out of the Columbia River. The Columbia River often makes a hard right because it's coming out with a lot of that fresh water um, influencing the, the southern portion of the beach and less so in the northern portion of the beach. There's also a lot of food coming in and out of Willapa Bay at that north end that's providing more nutrients uh, for people for razor plants as well. So how many days do we get to dig? That's always the bottom line. So we've made some significant changes in the way we we uh, determine the total allowable catch, and, and we do that now with a new method that we're calling the variable harvest rate. Before, we would apply a fixed harvest rate. However big the population was, we were going to target our harvest at 25%. And then, uh, a number of years ago, we modified that and moved it to 30%. And we continue to see that, that, that the population was fluctuating, but harvest didn't seem to make a difference. They were, there was a lot of natural fluctuation. Harvest wasn't then its deciding factor. So this three years ago, four years ago, we went to something we're calling the variable harvest, the variable exploitation rate for razor clams, and that's based on, a, on the strength of the population. So this is a measure of the strength of the population, VMSY, and that's the ratio of the current number of recruit clams over what we consider to be the, the virgin population. Now that's hard to, hard to measure, so we took strongest population we've seen today and decided on each beach we'll call that for now the virgin population and this is the ratio of that number over the of the current population that we're looking at so the stronger the population if it's real strong we're going to take we're going to uh, harvest at a 40 percent harvest rate so the weaker we're going to look at you know whatever that comes at 33 percent if it's as weak as 40 percent We'll go back to 30%, and then after that, we, it greatly reduces to a rebuilding strategy until if it's only 10% of the population, we would not open. Now, currently, and since we've instigated that, we've actually seen on three different beaches, two different times, populations that were bigger than what we had considered the virgin population. So we've been at 40%. Um, and so this provides, obviously, the higher this is, the more digging days there's going to be. That's, that's just the more export, the more plants you get today, the more days there's going to be. Um, so if we're trying this out, the agency made a, a, a policy decision to give it a try, see how this works, if this really, you know, if we're going to see a big decline in the raising plant populations that really do look like they're coming from harvest, um, we'll, we'll adjust this. And, and I say that because uh, the way we measure if razor plant populations are being driven by harvest or not, is through the razor clam reserves that we have. And you know there's one at Long Beach, up a, a couple miles north of Oysterville, that quarter mile section of beach opposed to harvest. We have one like that at Twin Harbors, we have one like that at Copalus. We don't allow any harvest in there. So, but at the same time we do our stock assessment work outside those areas, we do some stock assessment work inside those areas. And if there's a significant difference in those populations, and we haven't seen it yet, so if the populations outside of the reserve crash, the populations inside the reserve are doing fine, and that would be an indicator that, that, that harvest is a problem. In general, those populations are very similar. The only big difference is, in general, the size of the clams inside the reserves is larger. But the, but the, the, the ebb and flow of the populations are very, very similar. So that's, that's kind of our, our control area that we use to make sure that we're not over-harvesting. And just to review this real quick, and then I'll just sit down and let Zach talk. Um, this is just a long-term look at, at Long Beach in general back in 2012. This is the number of recruits we've measured. You can see this last year was a very strong year, and the year before that was a very strong year. And you'd have to look back 
all three of these years were very strong. That looked back a long way in our data to find years that look anywhere nearly that good. This is the total harvest of clams. Even with all the data we did in 2015, 94 days, we still only took 56% of what was the total allowable catch. <coughs> and uh, this year, um, believe it or not, in 11 days, with that strong population, we still took 32.7%. 17,300 people helped. Do that. <laughs> At least on one day. Uh, and you can see in 2012-13, um, we messed up and we went, uh, we went over that amount. And this is just a recap of what the other beaches looked like this last year. 4.9 million climbs to Long Beach, 1.9 at Twin Harbors, and this is the state share on these other two beaches. And I just want to remind you again about the video. Um, we, have an, we have three videos you might want to look at online. One is how to dig razor clams in Washington, and if you've got friends that are coming out, you all know how to do it, but they won't know how this is a, a good source of information. We have a video about how to dig with your kids. We often have people ask that question. Um, and we're actually fairly, um, I think, fairly uh, liberal in the way we allow you to dig with your kids. Uh, but I can tell you that it doesn't mean the kid stands there and you throw all the plant in his bucket. He has to actively <laughs> participate. So that's, that's, that's the and, and we see often, it's not uncommon to see one or two, generally, adult men digging clamps, and there's a line of women and kids all around. <laughs> <laughs> Our enforcement guys like to see that, and they, they, um, they'll be happy to write a ticket for those folks. Uh, and then there's one, let's see, there's one, and the other videos are um, the, the stock assessment video. We do keep a, a, a razor clam email distribution list that you're, I'd be happy to add your name to. Um, just send me an email, and I'd be happy to take your email today, or, or um, you guys, a lot of you guys have that email, we'd be happy to provide that. And we provide, one thing you'll get is our news release. As soon as it goes out, you don't have to wait for it to be uh, seen on, you know, on a website someplace. It'll come back to your email box. We'd be happy to give you that. And then we, we also provide some detail about the log acid sampling. That wouldn't necessarily be in a news release. And I think I have one more thing to show you. Yeah. Let's go to that other talk real quick. I'm going to show you the Department of Health slides real quick here. And, um, yeah. So, again, I wish they were here to, to, to speak to this themselves. I know a little bit about this, and I'll do my best. But in October of this year, the Department of Health issued a statewide advisory for razor clam consumption. And it came from a study that's been conducted by these folks um, for the last number of years on a group of uh, tribal diggers who uh, live uh, on the North Coast or either members of the Quinault tribe or the Quileute tribe. And um, as a result of, of watching these folks over a long number of years, they've, they've made a determination that uh, razor clam diggers and razor clam eaters, they eat a lot of razor clams, need to be careful. And so um, let me read through this for you. Um, you know all that. First of all, they're, they know that, we all know that when razor clam levels and, and they call the malic acid uh, amnesia shellfish poisoning. That's the technical name for the uh, for the syndrome that would be that you'd have if you ate too many razor clams and had the malic acid poisoning. Amnesia shellfish poisoning kind of speaks for itself. Affects your central nervous system and cause memory loss. And higher levels can cause stroke-like symptoms, and higher levels yet can cause death. So that's that's the name, amnesia shellfish poisoning. But when the malic acid or ASP toxin is high, anything above 20, the beaches are closed. So, at least in theory, nobody's eating those razor clams and there's no human health issue, the fishery's closed. But what concerned them is what is happening during this time, of, and, and you can see from 2006 or so up to 2014, there have been no closures, and the mock acid levels had all been below 20. Is there a, an effect on the central nervous system for people who are eating clams that still have the mock acid, but it's below 20? over a long period of time. And again, they did that with, um, with these tribal folks. And, and they've done some work preliminarily with mice, um, because they're not going to force feed you or I the malic acid, or at least not me, maybe you, I don't know. <laughs> but, but what they do with mice is they uh, feed them to malic acid and, and watch how they respond. And, and actually, there's a very good video 
that, that uh, this is a lot of work done by NOAA at their Southwest or Northwest Fishery Science Center in Seattle, but where they had had um, they produce a maze, but it's just a big, big galvanized wash tub with a lot of little entrances and exit points that are drilled on the side of the thing. And, uh, and then some of those, and on each one is a little bottle that they can, the mice can go into. And some of them have food in a warm place, and some of them are cold and icy. And some of them, some of them, in other words, some are desirable, some are not. And then they put the mice into the thing, and they pour in a little bit of cold water, so the mice want out of that water. So they start looking for some place to go. And pretty quick they find the warm place with food. And, and they do that over time, and they train these mice, so they, they put them in it. <coughs> Go right into that warm spot and figure it out real quick. And then they inject, it, and the, the, the problem with this study that I see is they inject them, the, the mice, with a democ acid. And you're not injected with it, you've, you're, you're, it's fed to you, but they like, expose them to democ acid, they give them, uh, they do that over a 30 day period, and they put it back into this maze. And those same mice that were going right to that warm spot can't find it. And they're all dizzy and moving around and they can't find it at all. So that was some of the basis for, for the study that they did on humans is that is what was, and, and those were low levels of demoic acid, by the way. The amount of demoic acid that was fed those mice was not crazy off the charts levels. They're relatively low levels of demoic acid. One of, the, one of the things the researchers have said, it's hard to know if the amount of demoic acid they're giving these mice would emulate a low level in a human body. Um, they did their best they could to make that happen. And what they saw was, over a period of time, there was a memory loss of these animals. So they did this study with between 800, or 500 and 1,200 um, folks, North American Indians in those areas that I just described. And they also measured their exposure to demoic acid by the number of razor clams they ate per month times what the current level of demoic, what demoic acid was at the time. They didn't actually test the razor clams they were eating, but they knew what time of year they were eating them, what the demoic acid levels were, so they could get an idea of their exposure levels. <coughs> and they found that, and, there, and I will say that tribal people tend to eat a lot of razor clams. Um, it's, a, it's more of a subsistence item for them than it might be for a lot of us. Um, but if they ate, especially adults and seniors, up to 15 razor clams a month over an eight year period, so oh, that's a lot of razor clams. I eat a lot of razor clams, but nothing even, I couldn't shine a candle in the lead. So high, high consuming adults do show some memory decline over time. So consequently, the Department of Health has issued that warning that's out there, and it especially applies to pregnant women. The warning is don't eat more than 15 razor clams a month over a one year period is what their warning is. Um, especially pregnant women, nursing mothers, the elderly, and uh, the same group that did this study is now going to conduct a survey of um, non-Indian diggers. They're going to be on the beaches uh, next time we're open, and they're going to randomly select folks. And, and basically what they're trying to find out is how many razor clams a month do you eat? And uh, you may run into that. Uh, we're not doing it. Uh, this is a study that's funded by the National Institute of Health. We're aware it's going on, and we're going to try to do it this spring, but the moment, yeah, so, <laughs> the monk has to stop it, so they weren't able to do that. So that's the Department of Health thing. So Zach, if you want to go next, um, then I'll ask people to hold their questions if that's all right. Uh, so that's that's the uh, overview. 
uh, or have the Olympic Ranger Harmful Algal Monitoring Program. Uh, it's a partnership between state, tribes, and, and uh, NOAA uh, to monitor uh, phytoplankton uh, that produce uh, biotoxins along our coast. Uh, so we're going to just look at some of the Long Beach data here real quick. Uh, prior to this, this program, this is how we operated. Uh, as Dan said, uh, we collect tissue toxin samples. They get sent to the Department of Health. There's about a two week window. Uh, if we did see the levels coming up slowly, we could increase that to uh, weekly tissue sampling. But uh, from the last few events, we can see these things accumulate toxins within four or five days. So that, that's not good enough anymore. Uh, we've added on all of this stuff to the left now. So this is uh, twice a week phytoplankton sampling. Uh, so we can do a real high frequency, low cost sampling and look for the plankton that produce the biotoxins. And then from there, go ahead and test for biotoxins in the seawater and uh, in the shellfish tissue itself. Uh, these are just some common maps. I'm sure most of you are familiar with them. We've got most about pseudonychia there on the left. Uh, so these cell counts are really been the backbone of the program. Uh, on the left, this is the basic mic light microscope. And then uh, some, some pictures at different magnifications there. At 200 mag 200x, that's, that's where we can do a cell count, pick out an individual uh, phytoplankton. On the left there is an interesting one. I was talking to a reporter a few years ago. And uh, he was trying to wrap his head around the size of these plankton. So there's a sand grain and, uh, and a tail armatus. Uh, this is the this is a plankton that looks kind of like a fuzzy caterpillar that when you go out on the beaches in the winter uh, produces that real brown foamy sludge and, and oil look. And so uh, up on the top right, there's Alexandria and Medonophysis, uh, two of the common halves. You can see we see them every year. And then Pseudonychia there on the bottom. Uh, something to consider and something that we've added on, uh, the rapid field toxin test. We've got a number of each of the different species that produce uh, biotoxins. And as you can see, basically every one of them, multiple species, toxicity varies, cryptic morphology, and a lot of times you need an SEM identification to do that. That's where we can come in with this rapid field toxin detection, detection to see if they're actually producing toxin. Uh, we started out using these test strips that were like a home pregnancy test. We've since moved to this ELISA method, so this is enzyme linked immune absorbent assay. We can perform the test in about two hours. It's uh, quantitative uh, and it's, it's very accurate. It's actually more accurate than HPLC. Uh, we're working with a company to develop this uh, amoca acid sensor based on a glucose meter. So that's a 3D printed machine. It's battery operated. If you take it on a boat, you can take it out to the beach and get a quantitative uh, result very accurate within about an hour. Uh, so, this is just looking at Pseudonychia on Long Beach uh, from 2000 to 2017. So, this is since the monitoring uh, program's been in place. You can see that every year uh, on the top panel we see Pseudonychia. What we don't see is particulate demoic acids. This is a demoic acid that's actually contained within the cells themselves. Uh, it's an excellent link between the demoic acid that's in the cell and, and what the clams pick up. Uh, if we drop down to the bottom panel, you can see that. So these are pseudonychia cell counts. This is the red dots are the demoic acid in razor clam tissue. So if you go straight down, the years we see high PDA, we also see uh, demoic acid above the closure level in razor clams. Uh, we also do some taxonomy work. So every time we go out and collect a sample, uh, this is uh, twice a week collect the net toe, and uh, we count basically all the number of species uh, down to at least a genus level, hopefully a species level. You can see there we see a large uh, interannual variation of, of phytoplankton species uh, in our coastal waters. Uh, the same thing with chlorophyll. We take a chlorophyll sample. You can see there's a large variation there. I'm going to bring this together at the end of the slide here. Uh, this is thinking about pseudonychia as part of the entire phytoplankton assemblage. Uh, what can we find out there? Uh, we can see that when pseudonychia is, is a dama diaton, this is kind of common sense, uh, that uh, we, have, we have issues with, with the milk acid uh, almost every year. Uh, and it seems to be that the year of high species diversity are the year that we see uh, pseudonychia. We're going to talk about this again at the end. Uh, 
Uh, I also do a, a razor clamp body mass indices, so we're tracking uh, spawn time framing, hoping we can relate that to uh, how the, the clams pick up and deprivate uh, toxin. And uh, I thought this would be interesting for the group here on the left. Uh, if you see it, you've got a, a clam foot that's kind of a dark pinkish grayish color. And then on the right, you've got one that's just strikingly white or opaque. Uh, the one on the left is actually a male clam, the one on the right is a female clam. Uh, so when, when you clean your clams now, you'll know if you have a male or female clam. It's usually about 50-50 uh, on the beach. And yeah, those are just developing or various stages of, of the razor clam gonad. Uh, we rank them in, in one to five, but you can see there on the left, there's a, a right female that's ready to spawn and one that's just spawned. Uh, this is that data. If we put it in a in a time series, uh, you can see in April and May every year is when the clams typically spawn. If you put temperature over the top of this, this is about when the water temperature hits 12 and a half to 13 degrees centigrade. Uh, there's a subsequent recovery period in the summer and then into the spring. And I, th I think the interesting thing to look at here, and we'll get into this on the last slide, is if you look at 2016 in the purple. You see a big decline in December, and then this red line is 2017. Uh, our clams never really recovered like they have in the last few years, and, and we think that's part of the reason why they held on to toxin for so long. Uh, the thought is that one of the ways that you get rid of toxin is you outgrow it or dilute it in your body, and the other way is you spawn and you lose body mass and you lose the toxin as well. So that could have something to do with this extended uh, closure, this is something that we're looking into. Uh, this is just for fun, what else do we see? Well, I discovered this trematode uh, in the razor clam foot when I was working for Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, luckily, we don't see it that often. It castrates the clams. It basically takes over the entire foot. Uh, and then it's just some other interesting stuff. The nemertine worm, I'm sure you guys have all seen those if you've cleaned clams. Uh, don't too much into that. So this is just kind of bringing it all together. Uh, and. When I first put this together, I thought it was kind of counterintuitive. Uh, when you've got high species diversity, you have low chlorophyll. Those are our summer months. When you have low species diversity, you've got high chlorophyll. Uh, so that would be in the, in the winter months there on the, on the top right. If we think about that and uh, the, the body mass indices, uh, we can see that our clams are really fattening from the surf diatom and through the winter months and in the spring when it's high diversity, uh, they're, they're actually losing body weight after they spot. Here's a 200 clams uh, basket down there at the bottom that Dan was referring to in Claylock. Uh, so this is to show you, you know, how, how productive of an area this, this is. Uh, you know, these, these chlorophyll counts, if you show these to an oceanographer, they, it just blows them away that we can have uh, hundreds of, of, of micrograms per liter of chlorophyll uh, when you measure offshore. If you, if you get hit of 30, it's, it's a really high number. Uh, this is just to start thinking about the body mass indices and how spawning and the subsequent recovery uh, affect toxin uptake and deprivation and the length of uh, toxicity in the, in the tissue. Uh, the, probably the biggest question besides is it, is it going to open, is, is, or is, is when it's going to open, not when it's going to close. No one calls us and says, hey, when's it going to close? <laughs> when it's open. Uh, so that's what we were facing with this, this from the 2016 events, rather than the 2017. I think the interesting thing here is, is looking at this, you've got magnitudes higher of, of PDA than you do in 2002. That was when the clams were losing body mass, spawning, and probably weren't feeding that much. Uh, but in 2002, with quite a bit lower, lower levels of, of particularly mug acid, we see a spike in the shellfish tissue uh, quite a bit higher than, than in 2015. And you can see that there might be some times where we're more, more vulnerable to uh, pseudonychia blooms that are producing DA, which would be in the, in the early spring and then again in the fall. And that's what we've been forced, faced with these last couple of years. Uh, and so this is the last slide. Uh, this is just thinking about the future, 2017 and beyond. I don't, this, the red didn't come out real good, but 
this is the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, so it's not El Nino La Nina, but it's, it's an index that's, that's kind of like that. Uh, when, the, when the PDO is positive, that means we're having a warm water here. Uh, so O1 to O4 here, this is supposed to be a little redder, uh, is a warm phase. Uh, Pre-recruits, the next line down, that's the, as Dan explained with the uh, SOX SMG, do the number of small clams that hit the beach. You can see those warm years are really good in 01 through 04, and then again in 14 through 16, four razor clam populations. Uh, they're low in chlorophyll, they're high in species diversity. Uh, if you remember back to the slide I showed you with Pseudonychia, we know that we see Pseudonychia where we have